Awesome, yeah. Nazma Saqib, uh, I'm a PM lead in our Azure Edge and Platform uh, organization, specifically in the enterprise and security team. Um, really, really excited to, to be with uh, uh, all of you today um, and uh, get the opportunity to to kind of share uh, what we've been uh, uh, spending uh, the last, um, uh, uh, I don't know how long, 18, 24 months kind of working with uh, our uh, Silicon and, and OEM partners on. Uh, and joined by by Roy, I think, uh, who is uh, speaking before me, and proceed. I'm really uh, excited to 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 talk to you about Secured Core. Um, so uh, I I think you know um, uh, the slide gets out of date uh, so quickly because there's so many security threats, right? But um, uh, I think you know uh, it should come to as no surprise to to probably anyone on the call that. Uh, security threats are uh, unfortunately uh, a a a, uh, a constant uh, issue for uh, uh, everyone in the industry. Whether you're uh, a, a customer, uh, a uh, 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 that's using a technology, uh, if you're someone that's helping to maintain infrastructure on behalf of a customer, uh, and certainly for us as uh, the 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 builders of the the technology that uh, 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 customers use, it's a it's a huge pain point. Um, there are so many different examples. Uh, of uh, of attacks um, and uh, there's you know unfortunately always a new one every day, but you know these these risks uh, these security threats are are real and they're costly, and so um, you know given how uh, the 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 landscape is is expanding for the use of um, technologies in the cloud and the edge around uh, compute there's so many interesting things going on. Uh, across uh, AI, ML, uh, and other workloads, you know the 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 value of security is is increasing uh, for for everyone in in the the ecosystem. So um, you know, as we uh, uh, kind of dive a little bit deeper and we think about um, uh, the 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 where are those threats kind of coming from. Um, you know, our team did a little exercise, and uh, you know, we we tried to 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 uh, see if we could identify the uh, the, the top top five. So a little bit of a simplification, but I think it'll help um, highlight uh, how we and our team are sort of trying to to think holistically about the problem and what we're doing to solve uh, for for security. So we'll talk about the the, the top five. So. Um, the 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 threat that is the the most common um, that we see in the the server the sort of compute space is is web shells. So basically, having a way for uh, someone to uh, for an attacker to access a web shell, typically um, you know it takes advantage of some kind of misconfiguration or uh, a vulnerability in in some kind of application that leaves. Uh, a web shell uh, exposed. Um, uh, uh, as you can sort of see, 140,000, that's the average number of web shell attacks per month. Um, so it's uh, uh, from uh, uh, in a six month period. Um, and that's actually an increase uh, from, from 70,000, so nearly doubling. So um, across the Microsoft stack, we are uh, investing in protections against web shells. We have Microsoft Defender uh, AV uh, that blocks web shell creation and execution. So that's, you know, signature driven, kind of a lot like what you expect from a antivirus. We have tools like Security Center and Azure Sentinel um, that will help provide um, uh, post compromise visibility into these sorts of attacks and alerting so that if you're managing a large infrastructure, you get to know what may be happening on um, a small subset of your nodes. And then um, on secured core systems, and you know, we'll get into a little bit more detail around the secured core solution we've built. We're trying to see if we can be a bit more proactive in enabling uh, mitigations all up. And so one of the key uh, capabilities that we enable for secured core is uh, virtualization-based security and hypervisor-based code integrity. They basically help enhance the security of the operating system kernel. 
uh, and make it harder for certain exploits um, to, uh, to, to take over the system essentially. And so that's a way to mitigate the impact uh, of, uh, of uh, someone having access to, to a system via a web shell. It basically says they can't do as much damage. So um, we have protections kind of across the stack to try and sort of help uh, customers mitigate the impact from web shells. Uh, so number two, um, threat number two in the, the that we saw was um, RDP brute forcing. Um, so you know, as you can see, general trend, right, which is attackers are trying to get into um, into these systems. Um, and you know, when you think about the the large amounts of customer data um, that uh, are being handled by modern applications, it makes a lot of sense, right? If uh, if you are an attacker, if you're a ransomware gang. You want to get access into into these sorts of servers, and RDP is one other way where uh, you can you can uh, 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 have remote access to to a server. And uh, RDP brute forcing is another attack that we saw. If you look at the trends last year, 768% increase in the number of uh, RDP brute force attacks. And so similarly, you know we have a, a, a multi pronged approach. Um, so you'll see another trend there, like, you know, I think at Microsoft, we have very much a, a defense in depth sort of perspective on, on security issues. And so um, we are investing in, in uh, strengthening uh, just the, the basic infrastructure of uh, our uh, remote desktop services and, and allowing for uh, MFA. Uh, as you RDP, um, Azure Defender uh, uh, allows you to to, to help uh, uh, have visibility into to, to all your logons and help surface the suspicious ones. Uh, and uh, Sentinel is uh, is another great way to to keep track of your infrastructure at scale and uh, monitor and alert on um, uh, suspicious activity as well. Right, so let's see what's uh, what's number three um, uh, exploits on on public servers. So that's really sort of basic saying it's like, hey, if you have um, an exposed application, uh, something like a web app that's running, um, you know, there are uh, 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 attacks uh, on them. Like uh, 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 we have seen that 22% uh, of uh, uh, of the breaches that uh, uh, that were observed uh, in uh, in the last year, I think, involved some sort of a, a, a breach around uh, a web app. And so, being able to apply like the the basic best practices of uh, uh, improving, um, you know, isolation, investing in attack surface reduction. Um, that's kind of the theme uh, that informs how we mitigate this particular threat. And so uh, uh, we obviously have hypervisor backed containers to provide stronger isolation so that, you know, an, a, an attack uh, or a compromise of a specific application does not um, uh, uh, allow more access to the attacker to to, to things that uh, 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 to other entities on the server or uh, other things remotely on the network. Um, we have technologies like Exploit Guard um, that you can enable in the operating system that uh, help uh, turn off potentially uh, unnecessary but uh, uh, sort of powerful uh, capabilities just so that they aren't available to an attacker. Uh, and then um, Azure Arc provides update and vulnerability management. So, you know, one of the big source of uh, a lot of exploits on applications is really using um, vulnerable uh, components. So, you know, something that, you know, uh, has a just hasn't been patched yet. And so being able to invest in the fundamentals around making sure that software you're using is patched, Azure Arc helps provide that capability. And then um, uh, Microsoft Defender uh, AV uh, helps uh, inspect malicious traffic uh, and malicious behavior on a particular node, uh, just so that uh, you can detect uh, any uh, particular attack on, on an application that's running on one of your servers. And uh, similar to, I think, what we discussed for threat one, um, for secured core, for uh, uh, secured core uh, Windows Server, secured core Azure Stack HCI systems, uh, enabling a, a basic threat mitigation like VBS and HVCI 
once again ensures that even if an attacker can compromise um, you know an application get some code running on on your server uh, it helps limit the amount of damage that they can do on um, uh, on any particular uh, on any particular node it helps with things like privilege escalation uh, and persistence Number four, um, uh, you know, uh, credential theft. Uh, you know, I think we've all heard of phishing, right? Uh, you shouldn't be clicking on an email uh, when you're using a, a desktop or a laptop. But you know, it is also an issue in uh, 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 the, the the compute uh, landscape uh, for for servers. Um, Sixty-one percent of all data breaches involved some form of credential theft in in 2020. So uh, the the majority of cases. And so uh, you know uh, the the basic best practices of having protection around credentials around identities um, uh, are really really important. Um, we have um, Windows Defender Credential Guard that helps protect uh, credentials uh, that are being used on any particular machine um, in hardware. Um, so that protects against things like Mimikatz, which is uh, used in a lot of uh, exploit kits uh, to harvest credentials from LSA. So uh, an important capability to be able to enable just so that any uh, credentials that are being used on any particular node for any kind of authentication, it isn't as easy for malware to attack it. Uh, and then Microsoft Defender has uh, uh, support against attacks or identity based attacks. They can detect credential dumping tools like Mimikatz um, when they execute on a system and uh, they have a lot of behavioral detections as well to, to, to monitor the uh, any risky behavior from unknown applications as well. Uh, and uh, uh, we think these are uh, critical capabilities uh, at, uh, at sort of mitigating uh, credential theft attacks. So what's number five? What's the last top threat, Roy? Um, ransomware. Um, and so uh, I, I, I think um, especially over the last few months, um, uh, uh, there have been so many uh, uh, examples of, uh, of ransomware in the news. Um, the, you know, there was a, uh, an estimate and who knows if it's still accurate that, uh, that you know, uh, uh, the, the economic damage from ransomware attacks was expected to total to 20 billion. Um, and, you know, some of the, the stats that, you know, the, the frequency of ransomware attacks that uh, uh, there's one happening every 11 seconds, it's uh, it's uh, pretty, pretty alarming. And so, um, you know, we have a, 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 a several capabilities across the, the, the Microsoft stack to help with ransomware attacks, um, application control with uh, Windows different application. Uh, control um, uh, helps uh, 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 allow uh, anyone that's managing infrastructure to create policies that only allow the applications that should be running um, on the, the, the platform. Um, so it can be such a powerful capability because basically at that point, you know, only uh, known applications that you've authorized um, are allowed to execute. And so, uh, it, you know, if an attacker, uh, uh, you know, finds a web shell or finds uh, an RDP endpoint they can log into, they can be very limited in what they're able to do because they can't run new code um, uh, because of what the uh, uh, application control policy um, enforces. Uh, Azure Security Center uh, helps um, uh, provide visibility into what, what's happening on any particular uh, node and can help with post compromise um, actions. And then, you know, this is a running theme, right? Uh, uh, HVCI and VBS, um, they provide uh, just a critical uh, uh, reduction in, in attack surface for the operating system kernel. You know, to use uh, uh, a kind of a well-known uh, example, you know, I think a lot of folks may remember WannaCry from a few years ago, very uh, well-known example of, of ransomware. Um, it took advantage of, uh, of a vulnerability in the SMB stack. Um, and uh, one of the observations that we learned from it is that, you know, if we, any systems that had HVCI enabled, 
would not have been impacted even if the bug was there just because the uh, the risky behavior that the uh, exploit took advantage of just isn't allowed on a system with HPCI enabled. So it's a great way to kind of improve the, the, the threat resistance of the platform that you're running is to have VBS and HPCI enabled. And then obviously uh, vulnerability management, uh, a lot of ransomware uh, uh, attacks kind of take advantage of unpatched software. And so being able to, 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 to do the uh, unglamorous, but uh, very, very necessary work of managing vulnerabilities, uh, making sure software is up to date, um, Azure Arc helps uh, to do that. So um, you've, you've heard me uh, uh, talk to uh, some of these capabilities as we are going through, through the threats. Um, Secure Core Servers is an investment that we're making uh, in partnership with uh, our OEM partners. And so one of the things that we are uh, 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 looking to do is to make things just a little bit easier. You know, this is not a silver bullet. It's not a panacea. Uh, it will not solve every problem. Um, as you know, we discussed, you know, dealing with uh, all the various threats that we have today uh, that are that are quite sophisticated and always advancing requires uh, a multi-pronged approach, a defense in depth approach. But uh, we think that one way that uh, uh, we can help is to enable um, some critical security capabilities uh, uh, from the start, from the get go. Uh, and so what we are looking to do with Secured Core Servers is to work closely with our uh, Silicon and OEM partners to help build systems that enable a few critical operating system capabilities around security by default um, from the start. Uh, and uh, uh, just so that, uh, you know, when you get a, a system that's a secured core one, uh, you know that uh, the hardware, the firmware, uh, the operating system in specific cases like an Azure Stack HCI integrated nodes, they have uh, a critical set of uh, uh, technologies that we enable, enabled uh, by, by default. And so there are three principles that we've uh, uh, used to, to inform you know, uh, the, the, the kind of customer promise that you get with Secure Core Servers. We want to provide advanced protection. Um, we uh, 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 are enabling Windows Defender System Guard that uh, helps ensure that uh, uh, our hypervisor, the hypervisor that's used for our virtualization-based uh, security offerings in the operating system, that they are resistant, uh, resistant against uh, firmware attacks. Um, uh, we think that that is an important capability since a lot of our research shows that there's a lot of interest in the security research uh, landscape in uh, in firmware exploits. And so we want to ensure that customers stay ahead of that. And then, um, you know, one of the, the, the critical things that we enable, and you may have you know, seen this in our discussion of the top threats, we're looking to try and get, uh, make it just a bit easier to take a preventative uh, defense posture to try and uh, protect against some attack vectors proactively. And so VBS features like HVCI, uh, which are enabled by default, uh, allows uh, the, the platform, the operating system, and the hardware underneath it to protect against entire classes of vulnerabilities uh, from the get-go. Uh, there are a lot of different VBS capabilities. Credential Guard's one of them. Um, a system Guard Runtime Attestation is another. And so while VBS and HVCI are the only ones that are enabled by default on Secured Core Servers that uh, ship with uh, an operating system that's configured by an OEM, um, you know, the getting a Secure Core Server means that you know that you have uh, good compatibility with VBS and you can optionally turn on a lot of the other capabilities that come with, uh, with the system. Uh, TPM 2.0 uh, comes on all Secure Core servers. It's now a standard requirement for new Windows servers. We think that the capabilities that TPM provides around uh, being able to securely uh, remotely attest to the, 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 the health of a platform, how it booted, uh, is an important capability, uh, and especially to have in hardware, just so that uh, in the long run, we can start creating really robust uh, zero trust uh, workflows for security that are grounded in being able to, 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 to provide conditional access 
uh, based on the uh, the health of your uh, of your platform. And all of this is uh, is done with uh, a perspective to try and, as as I mentioned, simplify things a little bit. Um, uh, uh, we, we're trying to get OEMs to enable these capabilities uh, by default. Obviously, there's a lot of other uh, security configuration that that uh, ultimately can can only really be done by uh, the people running the infrastructure. Um, but uh, you know, for some of the things that are that we feel are are binary capabilities that don't you know, vary a lot between enterprise to enterprise or customer to customer. We're trying to see if we can enable some of them uh, from the get go. And, um, you know, one of the things that uh, we know is, is important is just uh, easy ways to understand um, the the state of of, uh, of any particular node or cluster. And uh, that's where uh, we've been investing in the Windows Admin Center uh, to provide visibility into the secured core server features. So there's, you know, four or five features that uh, uh, that are part of the definition of secured core server. And uh, we uh, Windows Admin Center provides great visibility into what those capabilities are and uh, how you can enable them and proceed. We'll be uh, showing a bit more of that in, in detail later. Um, so I, I touched on this uh, uh, before. I think you know, you know, if you think about like the the uh, a sort of a simplified view of what secure core servers are, um, sort of physically, um, it it kind of is is built on um, you know three things. We we have been working with OEMs to ensure that they have a hardware root of trust with a TPM. Um, we've been uh, enabling uh, uh, protections against firmware level attacks. Uh, that's been a close collaboration with Intel and AMD uh, so that their uh, uh, upcoming platforms on Intel Ice Lake and AMD Milan uh, have uh, the necessary support to allow the operating system to enable uh, uh, System Guard, which protects the hypervisor and virtualization based security against uh, firmware level attacks. And all of that goes into, into providing that promise that I mentioned around raising the bar for uh, uh, attacks against the kernel and other critical system components in Windows. Uh, we enable VBS and hypervisor based code integrity by default on secure core servers using those underlying capabilities. Um, and so uh, uh, our hardware root of trust, um, you know, uh, we use the TPM to measure how the system boots, um, uh, both uh, for, you know, what we do with uh, the secure boot that a lot of you may be familiar with, um, and also for system guard, which uses a, a, uh, 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 a, a new uh, way to, to initialize uh, how we boot the hypervisor using a method known as uh, DRTM. Uh, measurements for secure boot and also the DRTM initialization process are made into the TPM. And that allows uh, anyone that uh, wants to use the TPM logs um, to, to know securely uh, how any particular node uh, booted. So kind of the core capability that we have. And then um, the uh, uh, firmware level attacks, um, as I mentioned, they're rooted in um, our uh, uh, partnership with our silicon partners. Um, they're actually specific uh, 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 x64 instructions um, that support uh, this capability that I mentioned, which is DRTM, the dynamic root of trust and measurement. Uh, it's a way to initialize uh, the hypervisor um, after a lot of the, the regular boot process executes. Um, the Windows loader uh, in, you know, uses those special instructions uh, to help uh, ensure that uh, uh, it is the hypervisor uh, that we expect, Hyper-V, uh, that gets loaded, uh, even if uh, potentially other unsafe uh, software may have run uh, uh, in, the firmware, uh, in the firmware layer. And then finally, uh, you know, the uh, 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 the 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 value of all of these things, they work uh, in concert with each other. Every everything is a building block uh, for for the next thing. And um, hypervisor based code integrity uh, provides uh, strong mitigations against attacks like WannaCry. And uh, the hypervisor uh, uses obviously the, the virtualization extensions that uh, are supported in hardware, 
uh, to have um, isolation between the regular kernel uh, and the uh, uh, things running in what we call the secure kernel, which is where you know, we store credentials that are protected by credential guard as an example, and also help enforce uh, protections on the, the normal kernel, like uh, the ability for the hypervisor to prevent um, even kernel level malware from uh, uh, overwriting uh, pages and things like that that allow for uh, privileged code execution. So, you know, as a whole, uh, you know, uh, we believe that it uh, that the the secured core stack uh, helps uh, raise the bar uh, against uh, a lot of the, the the common threats that we see, both in terms of being able to prevent uh, a lot of things from uh, uh, from executing in the first place from a malware perspective. Or uh, uh, or limiting the damage um, from uh, from any kind of foothold that an attacker might get. So I think uh, we're going to turn it over to proceed now, right, Roy? Yes, yes. So so proceed. Are you ready to talk? Um, I know you're yeah. under uh, severe weather. Not sure <laughs> if you still have a uh, access. I'll all good. Yeah, I could definitely still talk. Um, right. Hey, folks, this is. Oh, go ahead, Roy. No, no, go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, hey, folks, this is Priscilla again from the Windows Admin Center team. Um, of course, with that, with a heavy focus on security with uh, Azure Stack HCI and Windows Server, um, there's going to be a new tool coming to Azure Stack HCI uh, for security. Um, here, Roy, you can you can hit play here. Um, so here, uh, once again, I'll connect to my Azure Stack ATI cluster. And, and for folks that attended the GPU session, uh, you saw there was this new security tool that was coming to Windows Admin Center. Um, and so I'll, I'll connect to the security tool in Windows Admin Center. Uh, this is just a, a V1 version of our security tool uh, that brings some of the, the basic capabilities for managing the security of your cluster. Um, and we're absolutely looking for feedback here. If you want some new cluster security features to be lit up in Windows Admin Center, you know, please feel free to reach, reach out and give us some feedback. But you'll see two cards on the dashboard here, one for secured core and one for gen general cluster security settings. Um, of course, we're talking about secured core here, so I'll open our secured core tab and, and you'll see that the six features that encompass the secured core feature um, are visible across every node of my cluster. Um, I'm able to see which ones are, are on, which ones are not configured. Um, I'm able to enable or disable them. I'm able to see which ones are just simply not supported by the hardware. Um, in this case, neither of my nodes are, are actually supported by Secured Core. Um, and I can also click on here, Cluster Security Settings, and get some, some additional settings to manage my cluster. Um, and of course, if I, if I was seeing a fully secured core server, um, I'd see you know, green check marks all across the board. Um, so for each of the six features, once again, that encompass secured core um, that uh, uh, that um, Saqib just talked about, um, I'm able to see that all of these are on and, and this specific hardware, for example, does support all of the six features for secured core across every single node of my cluster. Um, and I, I do see a good green check mark here. Um, and of course, I can still manage uh, you know, cluster security settings, things like cluster traffic encryption uh, from within the security tool of Windows Admin Center. Uh, short and sweet demo. Uh, once again, just like the GPU tool, this will be released uh, next month for everyone to be able to try out uh, and, and, of course, give us some feedback. I think I pass it over to you, Roy. Awesome. Thanks, uh, Proceed. Um, let me try to switch the slide. All right. No, that, okay, cool. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Roy Sasabe. I'm a program manager at Agile CPU team based in Redmond, and I run security programs. So I'm going to use the next few minutes to talk about the secured core servers from ecosystem program perspective. And now uh, Sakib and Proceed have talked about all those exciting innov innovations went into the operating system and Windows Admin Center. Um, hopefully, you know, um, now you have a better understanding of what makes secured core servers so secure and easy to manage. And we're super excited to learn uh, launch secured core server with Agile Stack HCI 21H2. Again, the operating system has all the security advancements built in, uh, but the you know, secure core features won't work on operating system alone. It requires capable hardware, properly designed firmware, and operating system work all together. Um, that's why Microsoft has partnered with leading server manufacturers and silicon vendors over the past years to bring the secure core technology into the server space. 
So um, here are the industry leaders that we work together to enable Secure Core on server platform. We couldn't have launched Secure Core Server without close engagement with these partners. And we really appreciate their partnership and excited about our mutual achievement with the uh, Secured Core Server on Agile Stack HCI. Now, um, here's a summary of what you can expect out of Secured Core Server certified HCI solutions. Um, first, you have the hardware that's based on the latest silicon platforms that are capable of supporting Secured Core Server. Specifically, um, they are the um, third generation Intel Xeon scalable processors and the third generation AMD Epic server processors or newer. And next, um, all the secure core servers support TPM 2.0, secure boot, DBS, HPCI, boot DMA protection, and system guard. And you can rest assured that all of these features are validated by OEMs to their highest production quality standards that you know you can trust. And you are also provided with an OEM customized enabling guide, which walks you through the steps to configure your secured core capable servers to a fully protected state. And better yet, if you have a, uh, if you choose to, you know, purchase the solutions in the integrated systems product here, they will ship with the secured core features enabled out of box, so you don't have to configure it yourself. And last but not least, you can easily find the secured core server solutions on the Agile Stack HCI catalog when they become available to the market later this year or early next year. The secured core server certifications, uh, I mean certified solutions, will have a dedicated badge, and you can use the filter in the catalog to only show secured core servers you want. With that, we have covered now uh, how the hardware and firmware layer are fortified with the operating system on secured core servers. And we have seen the breadth of industry leading partners and boarded to support this technology. So this is just the tip of the iceberg for exciting security features in Agile Stack HCI. And we're so excited to be able to create a platform that is secure by default because your workload and data are only as, as secure as the foundation they are built upon. So again, thank you very much everyone for your time. And I'd like to open up the floor to any questions. Yes, you have to unmute. Okay. So thanks so much for the presentation so far. So uh, nice features coming. I actually have one question before we start with the uh, attendee questions. Um, I saw the um, uh, the uh, protected Hyper-V protected containers, and I was thinking, um, <laughs> uh, I was thinking, I know it's available for Windows containers, but uh, I thought, is that also available for Linux containers? So the Hyper-V protected uh, containers for Linux. So you got one question. Or Ashwin, for that matter. I think Ashwin is not here anymore. Or? Um, I see Ashwin here, but not Sakib. Yeah, I think Sakib maybe had to drop. Could you maybe just repeat the question once again? Yeah, um, uh, you have the Hyper-V uh, protected containers for Windows containers. So the Hyper-V containers. Uh, question was, is, is there also a kind of Hyper-V containers for Linux? Because I, I assume most of the containers are deployed uh, with Linux in it and not with Windows. Right. I mean, I'm I'm not very sure about this, to be frank. I, I'll, I'll maybe have to get back to you on this, yeah. yeah. Not a problem. Just was a question uh, because I, I don't have use cases for Windows containers. I uh, barely find uh, use cases for Linux containers, so would would be nice to know. Okay, coming to the to the questions from the audience, and I'm sure some of our MVPs have also questions. So, uh, is TPM 2.0 a hard limitation? So, uh, do we have to have it for a secure core? Yes, you do. Uh, yes, yeah. 
That was really clear. Two, two presenters answered with a, a clear yes. Yes, so, so actually uh, it's not only a requirement for the secured core server, um, it's actually a based requirement for the servers based on 2021 Silicon or newer when they sub, uh, submit for certification for tw uh, Windows Server 2022 or Azure Stack HCI. So um, you can expect that if you purchase like a Windows Server 2022 or like a, you know Azure Stack HCI solutions based on the you know Intel Ice Lake or AMD Milan platform, um, those have a TPM 2.0. Okay, so another question uh, that is uh, in my mind now, um, will there be a requirement for secure support in, in any future release of Azure Stack HCI? Because um, we have now, if you, if you nowadays buy hardware, there's still not, not secure core hardware there. And if you update it through the versions, so maybe to 22H2, 23H2, so if there would be a requirement for a secure core in the hardware, you can't update anymore. That would be against the five years support for the versions, if you know what I mean. Right. So will there always so, be a version that doesn't require secure core in Azure Stack HCI? Correct. So um, the secured core and even Windows Server. It's also in Windows Server, right? Yeah. So some of the features within, uh, you know, um, secured core server require uh, is ha um, hardware dependent. So yeah. uh, you would need to have a, plat a silicon platform that supports that capability, and specifically that's Ice Lake and uh, Milan for that matter. And mm -hmm. then um, for those, um, you know. Um, products based on the previous generation chipsets or CPUs, they don't have a capability to support uh, the full, you know, so secured core functionality. Therefore, we're not going to, you know, mandate secured core across the board, uh, including those uh, migrating or update upgrading to the latest, you know, um, version yeah. of this uh, Azure Stack HCI. So those, um, you know, um, um, solutions based on incapable hardware stays uh, without a secured core, but it is our direction to, you know, promote secured core or, you know, have secured core uh, adopted as much as possible for the newer, um, you know, solutions, uh, both for Azure Stack HCI and uh, Windows Server. Okay, thank you. So we answered that. Uh, is TPM 2.0 mandatory to upgrade Windows Server 2019 to 2022? No, uh, again, so um, when uh, TPM 2.0 is a new requirement for certification for Windows Server 2022 uh, for the latest uh, Silicon platform. So um, those, uh, you know, Existing solutions or the products in the market with Windows Server uh, certified for Windows 20, uh, Windows Server 2019, we don't require um, TPM 2.0 in order for them to be certified for Windows Server 2022. That said, um, it is strongly uh, recommended to have the TPM 2.0 uh, installed and enabled for um, you know for for any servers out there um, uh, going forward. Okay. So uh, another question is, is sh uh, shielded VM supported in Azure Stack HCI? So there was a, there was a big move about shielded VMs. <laughs> um, so, Ashwin, do you want to take that? Now, uh, so shielded VMs may not, will not be supported right now, but there are plans to introduce a shielded VM equivalent uh, sometime in the near future. Okay, thanks. No, but... Um, okay, I will I will type that later. So more questions. Wait, there are more. Um, someone asked about Windows Admin Center. Do we need to add the security extension, or is it enabled by default in Windows Admin Center? Uh, starting our next release of Windows Admin Center, the security extension will be enabled by default. So uh, another question, um, what about vTPM? Will that be linked to a CA for live migration or how will that work? Um, I, I don't think we have expertise in that area to answer that question. 
Okay, um, I played around with VTPM uh, and it was quite hard. You have to export some uh, certificates if you don't use uh, Shielded VM. Shielded VMs are not available in Azure Stack HCI. I learned uh, some minutes ago. So if uh, the question is, is, all, is VTPM even supported in Azure Stack HCI? So you, you have a virtual TPM chip in your VM. Is Alvin uh, still here? Or do you, or do, do you can answer this question, some of you? Well, we work more on the host side, so we don't have the expertise on the VM uh, side. <laughs> okay. So, uh, <laughs> something for Alvin maybe because yep, uh, Alvin uh, is definitely the right person. Alvin or Ram Jairaman, these would be the area owners. So I can I can check in with them and uh, revert on these. It would be great because if v VTPM support is not there, that would be a step back in security wise. So we can't do BitLocker in VM anymore in VMs anymore in Azure Stack HCI. Uh, I, I don't hope that's it's hard to implement, but uh, at least you can do it in Windows Server 20. If I remember correctly, you can do it, but the problem is the live migration of the machine because the data are somehow stick to the host or something like that. Yeah, I can I can give you information about that, Jaromir offline. I yeah. I, yeah. I did a webinar about it. It's possible oh. when you export the the certificates. Right, right. But the thing is, you it's not protected uh, protected against the administrator, right? So why you are you know bit lockering it? If the administrator can grab the the private key from the you know configuration of the VM itself from the file, right? So you can do, of course, bit locker, but uh, admin of the just a KCI host can you know. Uh, and decrypt uh, the operating system from the guest. So that's yeah, why the complete probably... protection against the administrator is no only shielded VMs, exactly. but it is at least some protection. Some is better than nothing. Not not everyone has admin rights on the hosts. There might be operators, right? Right. So it's not you. You don't have to be a, a local administrator to manage Hyper-V. So there is a certain amount of security to it. It's not full proof, but it does help in certain cases. Okay. Okay. There is another question. Not sure. Not sure how that will work, but certified slash signed drivers, etc. Will that require all drivers firmware to come from Microsoft? Um, I believe this question is about the secure boot. Um, the sign driver, yes, the signature uh, has to come from Microsoft. So it's part of the device certification pro, uh, you know, process. Uh, we have those uh, sign drivers, um, and then um, yeah, that that rest happens automatically. That as long as you have a properly signed driver, um, you know, the 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 system boots up happily. Yeah, but the I, as far as I understand, the driver is from the vendor, but they get a certificate from Microsoft to sign it, something like that, or? Yes. Or not only Microsoft drivers are signed, uh, but a vendor oh, no, driver no, no. <laughs> that does it right, has a, has a signed right. driver. Exactly. Yeah? So the third one, uh, party vendor uh, drivers are also signed by my, uh, using Microsoft signature. So another one, and I don't understand it, but still I ask it, is FTPM support uh, is FTPM support secure core or we need uh, don't don't get the question to the publish site or DTPM? I yeah, think. so <laughs> FTPM I is was just firmer. Reading, reading it, Helmut. <laughs> yeah, no worries. So the firmware TPM versus the uh, discrete TPM. So um, mm -hmm. currently, um, you know, we don't uh, we are not aware of any uh, firmware-based TPM for server platforms, so that's why we have, uh, you know, WHCP spec that mentions, you know, TPM 2.0 is only uh, certified. Uh, I mean, we require DTPM uh, for servers. However, um, this doesn't really mean. I mean, Windows is capable of uh, taking um, either FTPM or DTPM. It's just that there is no uh, FTPM in server space right now. So if uh, either Intel or you know AMD or whoever else come with a uh, uh, you know compatible solution, then um, you know there's nothing limits in the uh, from operating system view that um, uh, that um, you know makes the FTPM not functional. 
Yeah. So then another, this is a remark from Carl. VM, VTPM should be part of the feature set. Otherwise, you might not be able to install Windows 11. Yet Windows 2022 does not yet enforce TPM 2.0 for installation. So I think Carl says Windows 11 requires a TPM TPM chip, and yes. then you can't install Windows 11 VMs on uh, Azure Stack HCI. If you don't stop it for VDI scenario. Yeah, if yeah. we don't have VTPM support. Yes. And Manfred agrees, so it must be a problem. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Windows 11 should be a problem here. So Your VDI server. Is Windows 11 should be a problem. Yeah. No, only Windows, Windows 11 also. Uh, Windows 11 also. Yeah, yeah, in general. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so we're no back to installing. On, uh, <laughs> so we're back to installing server for VDI. You can you can run Windows 11 in the VM without the TPM. I'm just running it now, right? But I, I guess that there will be probably some feature that will be depending on uh, probably some kind of remote attestation that depends on the uh, TPM 2.0 or something like that. So yeah, maybe the preview and no, not the no. GA product. But the latest you... version uh, has a blocker that only is, allows, I tested this, um, and when I configure it in Windows Server 2022 with a VTPM, it's installable and without it says, uh, no, sorry, your hardware is not supported. Okay, weird. I'm okay. I'm. It was possible in the previous preview versions, but in the latest one, um, it's it's uh, required. Maybe you found a workaround, but I didn't find this. I, yeah, yeah, I can, thought it was a registry right? hack for that, right? I don't have any registry hack. I have a, like a, I converted the image from Windows 11. <laughs> And now I just do the latest update. <laughs> Sorry, I have to love a registry hack for that. Of course, you can turn off security by very easy uh, registry hack. I mean, uh, just saying. For that, I saying. have a for that I have a question here. So, if you buy a server from dot 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 or another China company, can you really trust the TPM two chip and uh, derived drivers? So there are some security concerns about companies from China. Sponsors of the Azure Stack HCI, though, they are, of course, excluded. Any statement here from Microsoft? I don't think so. Huh? We didn't name any names, so. But we said China. OK, we would Could also be another country. Yeah. <laughs> No, <laughs> so you don't have to command co uh, command on that. That's OK. Uh, I think you're questions? yeah, there is really nice uh, session on uh, black, black hat or blue hat conference, but there is yeah. like a deep dive into the um, how to hack the hardware, right? So how to compromise the suppliers chains. Uh, it's probably really complicated, but you could probably compromise any supply chain without the the tests i think what one company does in us they just create you know or manufacture all the de uh, all the machines all the servers in the us and they have the supply chain control so you can ship it to the american defense of uh, department of defense right that's what i saw on the blue hat conference yeah but and you by by any chance you have, it doesn't have to do anything with that company right no i it's okay. It doesn't have to do anything with the company, but the only thing you have to do is to have a kind of kind of special certification for the supply chain. So you need to regularly control check all the chips if there is not any extra layer in the chip itself, right? Because, but so, Jaromir, take a look at the in, Jaromir, we need in Azure Stack in the Azure Stack HCI catalog, we need something like a filter uh, certified by the Defense Department of the US. Uh, it would be probably special hardware, not the certification of, of the Azure Stack okay. HCI, right? Okay. Another <laughs> question. Uh, if I run Windows Server on top of another hypervisor, for example, ESXi, can I gain the benefits of secure server or secure core in, in server? I don't think so, but we have the security guys here. No. Um, so uh, secure core server is a host requirement. And then it's tied with Windows feature. So if you use a uh, um, different host operating system other than Windows, then um, the secure core server are features are not enabled in the way that we do. 
So, um, I mean, EXSI or, you know, uh, other solutions may have their own solutions. I mean, security solutions, but those are not uh, the same as Secured Core Server. So the, the next question, and we are nearing the, the, uh, the midnight mark here in Europe, so uh, only seven minutes to go. Uh, so I will read it out. I, 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 I don't think I understand it. A defender for identity is surfacing remote code execution attempts when managing a remote server through a VAC gateway. When using an admin account that is a member of the protected user group, Kerberos out only, no NTLM v2. What is happening on the back end? Uh, is it in VOC command? Is VAC starting a PS uh, session with Kerberos authentication? What is the PS session authentication? Used so I think some concerns about WAC using uh, going to the machines. Yeah, Windows Admin Center does open a PowerShell session from the gateway where Windows Admin Center is installed to the managed node that you want to manage. So, for example, if you have Windows Admin Center installed on your local Windows 10 machine and you're managing a Windows server, it is opening a PowerShell session from that Windows 10 machine to your Windows server instance. Uh, what authentication is it using? Uh, it actually depends what you have set up. Um, if you have set up Kerberos authentication between your gateway and your managed node, uh, then it will use Kerberos. Um, uh, if not, it is just using the traditional uh, anything you would use for enter PS session and you would enter those credentials. It's actually just using the traditional authentication that your gateway would uh, you'd use for uh, any remote PowerShell connection outside of Windows Admin Center. OK, so these are the questions I could ask. Um, are, are there questions from uh, the speakers? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> from other speakers than Jaromir, because first we want to give someone else a chance. <laughs> Nobody else? OK, Jaromir, go. So uh, are there any up to date uh, Spectre meltdown mitigations recommendations like should we enable it or not or keep it the default? Because there, there is like a whole you know, set of the Spectre meltdown mitigations recommendations right in general, but is there anything special for the just like HCI? Should we keep it as it is or you know, should we go and configure it or you know? I think our uh, guidance will remain the same. Ashwin, if you know anything else but or specific to like um, the recent, you know, uh, release of operating system, I think uh, the guidance will be exactly the same between uh, just like HCI and uh, Windows Server 2022. Or just configure it, right? Uh, every yeah. time, or just based on the workload. If you are a hoster, you probably should. If you trust the, the VMs, then you don't have to, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing. Uh, uh, to, to my knowledge, there's nothing that's fundamentally different for Azure Stack HCI that's been offered. So, yeah. Okay. Um, then another question is again uh, around uh, all of these secured core features. It's kernel DMA, kernel DMA protection, right? VBS, uh, user mode, oh, kernel mode code integrity, and all of these features I think were already available in Windows Server 2019. So. So the difference is now that there is a certification process for the OEM, so the hardware really supports it, or what's the difference on the software? So, side? yeah, so that's a, gr a great question, um, actually. So uh, the feature uh, from operating system uh, perspective is there because Windows Server 2019 shares the code base with RS5. And, um, you know, Secured Core PC is, um, you know, available uh, with RS5. So, um, but um, yeah, that's that's right. So we haven't had a certificate official certification program to make secured core work on servers. And then there are some, um, you know, uh, additional uh, code, uh, piece of code that went into the, um, you know, Azure Stack HCI and one, uh, Windows Server 2022 to make it work for the uh, server platform. So um, you can't really, uh, I mean, secured core on, you know, uh, Windows Server 2019 is not a supported or tested uh, scenario. So, okay. um, yeah. That's awesome. 
So I have a and question. Last... Uh, wait, Jeremy, I have, I have another question from the audience. Um, and then you can go again. Since VAC can also manage Windows 10, thankfully, will will be able to check and help to en enforce secure core also for Windows client OS. It would make sense on Windows 10, Windows 11, as some of the basic features are part of the feature set. What do you think about it? The security extension for Windows Admin Center does support Windows 10 client at the moment. Yes. Oh, that's. I think Carl is happy about that answer. Thank you. And uh, now, Jaromir, <laughs> if you want, if you have one more. Okay. Yeah. There was a. You mentioned in the slide that there is a, a possible TPM attestation, and I know that there was a nice white paper around releasing Windows 8, so it's really old, and it was mentioning TPM attestation service that can be developed by any third party service. So is there any plan to, you know, enable TPM attestation service in Azure, you know, using a Defender ATP or something like that? Or are we using it already? Um, I think the short answer is no, but I don't have any visibility into our future plans. Right. Um, uh, Ashwin, do you have anything uh, you want to share or? Uh for uh, Azure Stack HCI, I'm guessing for hybrid cloud scenarios, uh, there, uh, yeah, again, I'll have to follow up. Short answer is even same, same as Roy, that I don't have visibility into that, but I do believe that there might be some attestation service that uh, that, that could be spun up uh, sometime soon. But I, again, this is something I'll have to check with the feature teams and get back to you on. Yeah, because I think this is already somehow available for Windows 10. Because I saw some developer tweeting it, um, yeah, that he was working on this feature, uh, and it was recently released. I don't know, you know, a few months ago or something like that for the Windows client operating systems. So I was just under the impression that something similar will be also for the Azure Stack HCI. Yeah, 